the pagan Roman Empire and the papal Roman Empire are two distinct and uh, interesting uh, cultural institutions. Now, pagan Rome has uh, been constantly on the lookout for the Germans, the barbarians. And they had a strategy of inviting each other, each of the ten tribes, the Saxons, the Anglos, the Franks, the Borgundians, the Swabi, the Visigoths, uh, Astrogoths, and so on. And, and, and set strife amongst them so that uh, they kept them fighting amongst themselves. But then Juda Judaism had spread to Europe. These Jews had been banished by the Romans, and so they were scattered all over. And even though these people were pagans, many of the Jews endeared themselves to these various peoples, married into the royal families and so forth. And uh, they perceived some of the Jewish religion, uh, tenets, the Bible, etc. And uh, they realized that they were all brothers, and they should love each other. And they put aside the fighting, and they united. And this un unity came around in close to 476, so that in the year 476, they united um, Germans, barbarian Germans, were able to smash the Roman Empire, from the Anglo-Saxons up in the British Isle, down to all of them, and they just ended the Roman Empire. And so, um, Christianity was gaining in Rome, and uh, Constantine the Great realized that his predecessors, who had been persecuting Christians, uh, that is, Theoclosian, Trojan, and Decius, uh, had been persecuting Christians. And let me use a figure here. When the first persecution started, there were about 100 Christians. And when he died and it ended, there were like maybe 100,000. The second uh, emperor came on, he started to persecute. And uh, when he died, there was a million. And the last one came on, and when his time ended, there were about 5 million Christians. So when Constantine time to be emperor, he realized that fighting Christianity was a bad uh, mistake. And so what he did, um, he said he had this dream with a cross and all this kind of stuff, and he joined the church. And he realized that the way to destroy many things is not to fight from without, but to fight within. So inside now, he brought in many of the pagan sort of uh, beliefs and practices. He started to venerate saints, um, started to um, bring in, you know, worship of idols and so on, brought in the paganism, uh, shifted it from the Sabbath to Sunday, and um, trying to appear as if he wants to bring both pagans and Christians together. But just like the others, he had hated uh, Christians, and so he was able to succeed. And when he died, I would use a figure again, Christianity had come back to maybe about 200,000. So he did discover that you infiltrate and you destroy from within, it's much better than fighting from without. And so, um, here now you have the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, it has nothing to do with Peter and the keys of this and, and, and cornerstone and all that kind of stuff. This is straight up a political movement come religious because they couldn't exist politically. It was very hostile, and so church was a good way to start. And so the high folks in the Roman Empire joined the church, and they kept all this pagan stuff, and now today... Um, you have the um, Roman Catholic Church. But in 1517, around then, uh, Dr. Martin King, <laughs> sorry, Dr. Martin Luther, um, who had been thinking and debating and reminding others, decided to postulate his uh, 95 Thesis on the Church in Wittenberg. And uh, when I review it, basically, um, he just wanted to help the church to really be more powerful and to be strong. He had no intentions of destroying the church. Um, and so he talked about he is loyal to Mother Mary and he's loyal to the Pope and so on. But it's just the intelligence says it's not working. It's just like robbery, whatever. And in spite, he wanted to build St. Peter's uh, Cathedral down there in um, you know, Italy and uh, in the Vatican. It wasn't uh, worthy to you know try to sell people something that has no value because uh, there's no way the Pope could have conferred forgiveness and the whole abuses with the indulgences and so on. And um, they, of course, burned into the stake, I think, if I remember my history. I did this history way back in 1979, okay, so forgive me on the point here. And so this was recognized at the beginning of the Christian Reformation, in which 
Um, you had these various people now who took opportunity of somebody speaking out against the orthodoxy and so on, uh, even though he died. And you had these various people coming on, such that um, you have these various um, different Protestant, so called Protestant uh, churches that came out of Rome. But the Anglican Church is interesting because I don't think they started because of this Martin Luther revolution and so on. The, the Christian Reformation. They started simply because the king was married to Charles V's sister, and uh, she wasn't having he wasn't having any sons. And so he thought that if he were to divorce her and get a next wife, perhaps he might get a son to the heir, etc. And uh, he petitioned the Pope, said, uh, "I'd like to divorce this lady." I mean, but the Pope started to play games with him. He said, uh, "You know, I'm busy now, and this and that, or whatever." But the Pope was thinking that. He was under the domination of Charles V, her brother. And had he granted uh, the king permission to divorce his wife, then Charles V might have had to deal with Charles V. And I don't know if he sent a threat to him saying, you better don't give no permission to divorce my child. So, sister, so what he did, I think it was Henry VIII, he just formed his own church. And they divorced him and then he was able to move on. And that's the genesis of the Anglican Church. Uh, and then they kept on with the Reformation, you know, for and so on, and they are included into the Reformation. But the Catholic Church will never be stopped. Um, I recall, although the ten Germanic tribes were able to smash Rome at various parts of the empire, um, they fought back, and this priest by the name Arius left the Egyptian uh, Orthodox Church or whatever and went up to somewhere in Germany there and joined up the three the tribes, the Ostrogoths, the Vandals, and I think the uh, Visigoths, and began to teach them a funny religion thing about, it, it, they call it Arianism. I've never that dealt much into this thing. I don't like religion to evil and stupid. But they, they subscribe to this Arianism, and uh, whereas they were able to unite because of Christianity, this Arianism was more like paganism again. It wasn't the regular Orthodox Christianity. And um, they were able to destroy three tribes. So the only seven tribes that, that exist, the Anglo, the Saxons, the Lombards, the Franks and France, the Anglos and Saxons and Britain and so on. Um, yeah. And so um, Martin Luther basically, um, you know, is seen as the one who started this Reformation thing. Now, I'll tell you what I believe. I believe the um, choice of uh, Pope Benedict is a strategy because the barbarians destroyed Rome. Martin Luther caused a split and a schism in the church, and so now, in putting a German as the Pope, he's hoping they're hoping to uh, recover from the 476 loss to the barbarians and the uh, 1517 um, Protestant movement beginning with Martin Luther. Germans, barbaric Germans, um, Dr. Mar Dr. Uh, Martin Luther, uh, another German. And so having Benedict now is more like a counter thing. They're trying to uh, absorb the 476 defeat and the 1517. Now, this Pope has a big challenge because right now it all seems as if nations are aware of this move to really, you know, let the Roman Empire through the church come back up and, and executively run the show. Because in history, you had several times popes, you know, talk big and loud and then you know, they, they subjugated some kings and some emperors because, um, and I can't remember the name of the, I think it was, anyway, I don't know call any names here, but this uh, pope excommunicated a certain um, guy in Europe there and just saying whatever, and then he came on his knees crawling up to, you know, get pardon and forgiveness because when you excommunicated, the people felt like if there's a dirt hanging over and, and they would rebel, etc. So he had to humble up, went up, crawling on his knees, got forgiven forgiveness and I think he came back after and smashed the Pope and so on. And so today um, Benedict has a big job because um, nobody don't believe that the Catholic Church could pull it off. And um, with the scandals of the sex, this and that, people saying no, 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 it can't happen. But this is happening in a world in which uh, there's sin straight up. So it's not only these boys with the with robbery and so on, but you have Society, you know, people into witchcraft and, and Wicca and magic and straight up voodoo. So, you know, is everybody kind of tarnished? 
And uh, I do believe what the Bible says that they're going to they're going to get somewhere. And of course, uh, when the deception has been you know clear and, uh, and and folks believe that there would be really peace and safety as they might promise, and it's only um, things got worse, worse forever, uh, sudden destruction according to the Bible, and then folks are going to turn and if it's <laughs> Pope Benedict or whoever is in here, and uh, it's going to be very disastrous. So this little uh, talk here was basically trying to trace uh, the German effect on the, the, the pagan Rome and now the papal Rome and that uh, with uh, Benedict they're hoping to somehow uh, maybe pull it off. Well I'm just you know an observer and I'm watching to see what he's going to pull off. I, I don't know if, how far it's going to get. Like, the scripture is not clear and you know exactly what's going to happen but you know Christ is going to come one day and uh, end this whole uh, masquerade and this whole uh, deception.